Our first speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Ko. Dr. Ko graduated from Mount Holyoke College with a bachelor's degree in biology and education. She received her PhD in biomedical sciences from the University of California at San Francisco, where she focused on immunology and host pathogen interactions. Six years ago, Dr. Ko joined the faculty at Boston University, where she teaches biology, anatomy, physiology, and human infectious diseases. Dr. Ko won the prestigious Boston University Metcalf Award this past spring. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Ko. Thanks for having me at this Brad talk. I, um, for my talk, I decided to focus on one of the things that I love to talk most about, which is our amazing bodies. That's what I spend most of my time talking about, in fact. So these are three kind of little stories about the way that we eat and how our biology influences our um, eating habits. So most of the time, for most of our senses, you and I kind of experience the same things, right? So we're all sitting in this 70-ish degree room, and we all experience it as being relatively comfortable. As you hear me talking, you recognize that you're hearing a human voice. And if we had a visual stimulus like this, we would all kind of agree that we're looking at a black shape. It's some sort of symbol. There's some straight lines and curvy lines. If we've been taught to, we would recognize it as the letter B. So all of our senses kind of give us the same experience. But if we shared one of these beverages, which I think we might get to later, um, then we might have very different experiences. One of us may describe either of these as being extremely bitter or extremely sour. Other people may finish it quickly, enjoy it, ask for more, right? We may have notes of chocolate or fruity undertones or different types of responses to the different things that are in there. So in short, when it comes to taste, we all experience something different. So then that kind of begs the question, how and why, right? If most of our senses, we experience the same thing, and yet we have this taste. So in order to get to the answer there, we've got to go through a little bit of the biology. So taste receptors are going to be the kind of key to understanding this story. So if you stuck out your tongue or you looked at someone else's, you would see small bumps kind of all over the surface. These are papillae, and inside of each one, you'll see this kind of, well, you wouldn't see them because they're microscopic, but there are, <laughs> this cluster of taste cells. Um, and attached to the bottom of them is a nerve or a neuron that can carry information to the brain. On the surface of these taste cells are receptors, and the receptors interact with molecules in our food. So a sugar molecule, for example, that came from, say, table sugar that we put in our coffee, binds to one of these sweet receptors, and then that sweet receptor is able to send a signal up to the brain to register that sweetness, and we experience it. So these receptor interactions are based in completely on size and shape. So anything that can fit and kind of signal into the receptor is going to send that information to the brain. So you can see a glucose molecule from table sugar fits that receptor and we get that sweetness sensation. A fructose molecule from fruit juice binds the receptor and we get that sensation. And the last molecule we have up here is aspartame. It actually has no caloric value and it was derived in a lab, but because it's the right size and shape, it still binds to the receptor and we still perceive sweetness. So as humans, we have six categories of these taste receptors. So there's salty, sweet, bitter, and acid, or sour, as we were all kind of taught in elementary school. And then there's umami, which is a savoriness and a recently discovered fat receptor. And so each of these has a certain shape. It binds a certain shape molecule. And what we perceive as we sip that cup of coffee or if we butt, bit into, say, a hamburger, we would perceive kind of this mosaic of the different receptors that are sending information up to the brain. And so that will help us to kind of understand how taste can be very complex. But it's not the whole story. So it's not that I have one bitter receptor and you all share that same bitter receptor. In fact, there are currently 23 identified bitter receptors and probably more to be discovered. And we don't all express the same ones. So I might express a handful of them and you might express totally different ones. If I do not express the bitter receptor for a certain molecule, then I can't perceive its bitter flavor. So where this all kind of um, all of this diversity happened is as humans migrated out of Africa, then kind of colonizing the different um, locations around the globe, then early humans evolved to meet their environmental conditions. And this gives us a lot of what we can see as kind of ethnic differences. But we weren't just evolving on the outside. Our tongues were evolving too. So as humans migrated to um, places with warm climates, then their 
uh, tongues would evolve along with the diets that were available there. But these humans in warm climates had something else they had to think about, which is that their food was subject to spoilage because of the warm temperatures. So early humans figured out that if you added certain molecules, spices, and plant derivatives to the food, it can preserve them longer, making you less likely to get sick. So as these additives came into the diet, the tongues evolved to be able to um, taste them. But if we look at humans that evolved or migrated to colder climates and then evolved there, they not only did not have access to the same plant material, they also didn't have this concern over food spoilage. So humans from um, colder climates began to lose some of their expression of receptors because they didn't have anything that would trigger um, sensation through them. And if we look at humans uh, migrating to what is now northern UK, there's individuals here, many individuals, who lack almost all bitter receptor expression at all, which means that if they, say, imbibed a relatively bitter beverage or, or food, they wouldn't be able to taste all of that bitterness that someone else with those receptors would. What they would experience instead is the undertones, those notes that, that someone who's kind of being knocked over with the bitterness doesn't get the chance to enjoy. And so what we have is that kind of everything that we taste is this synergetic symphony of, of the kind of molecules within our food and which receptors we express. And no one person is going to experience exactly the same thing as anyone else, except, of course, for identical twins. And that brings us to kids. So one of the things that's really challenging as a parent is when you serve up a nice bowl of some bitter flavored food that tastes great to you and you serve it to your kid and they won't eat it. And so a lot of times parents are frustrated with their kids because their kids are whiners, or they're frustrated with themselves because they didn't parent them right. But really what's happening here is that kids are just better at tasting than adults are. Like almost everything else with the nervous system, kids have a much higher molecular expression of receptors. And in fact, for every person in this room, no matter how old you are, we're just going to continue to decline our receptor expression for the rest of our lives. So right now, today, is as good as it's going to be for the rest of your life. <laughs> So when that you look at kids, it's not that they are whining. It's not that they um, aren't going to ever be able to appreciate bro broccoli or peas. It's just that right now, they're just much better at tasting. And so they're experiencing what we experience as a whisper of bitter flavor. They're experiencing is like being yelled at. So that brings us to our second story, which is about saliva. So we wouldn't really be able to taste anything if it weren't for the saliva in our mouths. So let's talk about that. So adult humans produce on average about 1.5 liters of saliva per day, which means that if you did nothing but sit there and drool, by the end of the day, you would fill up two wine bottles. So why? Why do you donate all of this water to this process of saliva? So one thing is that it helps you to taste. So all of these molecules need to dissolve in water in order to access those tiny little taste pores. Uh, and so if we have less saliva, then we experience a lot less taste sensation. But there's other things that saliva does too. So saliva contains lysozyme, which is an antibacterial agent. Uh, it actually has the same mechanism of action as penicillin. So it's really great at killing off bacteria. It also has histatins, which are wound healing enzymes. So taken together, saliva is really great at healing wounds, which means that if you get a cut or you bite your tongue, that you will heal two to three times faster than if you had the same wound on the surface of your skin. And so lots of organisms have figured out about this amazing wound healing of saliva, and they've been doing this for a long time. And in fact, so have humans. So in Europe in the, 19th, in the 1700s, rather, um, saliva was used as the kind of um, first line of defense against um, syphilis, which was the kind of scourge of the day. And in ancient Chinese medicine, uh, saliva was applied to armpits to reduce the bacterial load there and therefore reduce the smell that they caused. So lots of different organisms have used saliva as a healing agent as well as something that helps us to taste. And that brings us to our third story, which is about the microbiome. So estimates vary, but we can assume that you have a lot of microbes in your gut. So lots of scientists like to kind of uh, argue with each other about these estimates, but it's somewhere on the order of about 100 trillion bacterial cells sitting inside your small and large intestine, which means that in your intestines, you carry about three times more total bacterial cells than you have human cells in your entire body. So you're actually much less of a human and more of a bacterial sac. <laughs> and so what they're doing there is kind of really interesting and to the subject of a lot of different studies right now. 
So all healthy humans, kind of look at all of us healthy people in this room, we all share some of the species. So for example, E. coli would be found in all of our guts. But there's also a lot of individual variation. And so this variation has been the subject of a lot of study. And one of the things that people are looking at is where the role of the microbiome might be in the obesity epidemic. So it turns out that if you sample a whole bunch of different individuals' um, microbiomes, you can classify with about 90% accuracy which of those samples came from individuals who are obese versus which of the samples came from people of a healthy weight. And so microbiome sampling is not only really easy, it's also kind of an elegant science. So there's lots of things that you can discover. And so that leaves us to kind of a chicken and an egg. So it is the microbiome determine metabolism or is it determined by the metabolism or diet? And so of course, we can't answer that question without learning a little bit more. <clears throat> So when you eat something, a lot of what you're eating is actually indigestible to you, right? So you and your own human processes can't break down a lot of the foods that you take in. But our microbiome helps us out. So our microbiome, the, the cells that are in your gut, are breaking those foods down all the time. And what they release when they're done breaking things down are called metabolites. Collectively, we call all of these things that we can't digest ourselves fiber. And it's kind of well known that fiber is good for you, but we don't really understand why. So we put this food into, and we digest as much as we can, and the rest is there for the microbiome. So these 100 trillion cells can start to break things down. And so what happens is these metabolites are released, and they are kind of like signaling molecules. They travel all over the body and affect the physiology of our different organs. So we found that they can influence metabolism and behavior and make you more or less likely um, to develop certain diseases. But some of these things, some of these metabolites that are released are really just nutrients. So you couldn't digest this before, but with the aid of bacteria that broke it down partially, you can now absorb new nutrients and calories from your meal. And since every individual has a unique microbiome, that means that we can have really different experiences in terms of what we can derive from our food. So if you and I share a pizza, it's likely that my microbiome can break it down and make more calories and more nutrients available to me than you. And so we can all have these very different experiences. And further, if we take the microbiome out of one person and we give it to another, then that recipient is likely to change. He or she might gain or lose weight, develop or um, lose insulin resistance, um, or change their likelihood of developing certain diseases. The changes always mirror the microbiome donor. So it's a good lesson to you that if you are going to borrow someone else's feces, you want to be sure that you like what, you, what you're going to get. <clears throat> so the last part that I'll tell you about is about mice. So here we have two mice that are genetically identical except for a single gene. And that gene mutation makes this mouse over here, if I can remember which one it is, there we go, this mouse more likely to develop obesity. So we take these two mice, again, gen genetically identical in every way except for one, we put them in the exact same environment, give them the exact same food but they develop different microbiomes. And so if we go back to our chicken and egg, right, this, the question was, does the microbiome influence metabolism or is it influenced by metabolism? It seems like the answer here is much more of an and. So we definitely can see evidence that the microbiome does influence metabolism. We also have evidence that the microbiome is influenced by our metabolism and diet. <clears throat> So to wrap all of that up, the kind of bottom line is that you and your relationship with food is unlike anyone else's. And just like all aspects of diversity, I hope that you guys really appreciate and kind of love that we're all different in this way. And that's it. I'll take questions. So I can take a couple questions. If anyone has them, they can raise their hand for the mic. I think that recently there was a study with like some news come out about how uh, on the cell journals, uh, someone published about how probiotics might not be that good for you. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard about this, um, but since we're kind of talking about the stomach flora, I kind of want to hear your, uh, hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. 
Great question. So the question is whether or not probiotics really are useful um, and whether they might even be harmful. So um, probiotics are kind of packaged up capsules with bacteria in them. Um, and so you take them and hopefully that bacterial capsule kind of blooms in the right place and adds to your microbiome. So one of the things that we know is that microbial diversity seems to be really important for a healthy, robust microbiome. So if you have 100 trillion cells, but they're only made up of 20 different species, then you might be more at risk for some different things than if you had 200 species represented. So if you're taking these big kind of wallops of one or two or a handful of different species and packing them in there, then you're likely to outcompete some of the lesser represented species and reduce diversity rather than enrich diversity. So that's, that's kind of a part of the reason why they think that it's not that good of an idea. Yeah. Hello. Oh, it's weird to hear myself. Okay. So my question is back to the taste buds. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking about how environment affects your taste buds. So does it, how does it affect like the biology because I know growing up I don't really like salty food but then my friend here loves salty food but um, then like if I go somewhere over the summertime eat a lot of salty food I come back and I like it a little bit more in comparison to last year because I can compare it to her <laughs> um, so does this happen because the like how does the molecular biology change in your tongue because of environment Great question. So, um, so the stuff that I was talking about was more like evolution over, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. But what you're asking is a much more kind of smaller scale. What changes from month to month? or year to year. Um, and so one thing, of course, is that we do lose receptor expression over time, which makes us more tolerant of new things. Um, your receptors can also become desensitized so that they fire signals towards the brain less often. Um, and then receptors can have uh, interactions near each other. So if you have a bitter receptor right near a salty receptor and you're getting signaling through both of them, you can actually have one of them inhibit the other one so that it doesn't send signals. So that's actually how like salting your food ends up making it taste better because you're going to lose out on some of that bitter sensation or other sensations that you would have experienced.